my test one two one two
you want to start the recording or well okay so um uh, welcome to the fourth lecture of the uh 28th lefevre winter series on aging um and as you know i'm your host i'm elena volpi um and this is a series that honors the uh, memory of Dr. Edward Lefevre and his daughter, Dr. Nancy Lefevre Hughes. Um, they were both highly um, respected physicians in Galveston and a uh, professor of medicine at UTMB. And they practice uh, medicine on the island and they particularly love to take care of older adults. So uh, the series was started at the death of Dr. Edward Lefevre by his uh, family and friends, um, and who ended up this series, this lecture series in the City Center on Aging. Um, and after last year's uh, unfortunate death of uh, our friend Nancy Lefevre Hughes, um, they actually pitched in even more, and so we uh, have now, uh, we're now honoring also her memory along with that of her father. So this lecture series, as you know, features uh, nationally, internationally renowned uh, researchers and uh, speakers on, on geriatrics and gerontology, and, um, and and today, I'm really happy to actually have uh, introduce you one of our own, um, who happens to be uh, UTMB's own uh, s senior vice president, chief medical and clinical innovation officer, uh, institution emergency preparedness officer, Cillian Smith, distinguished chair in internal medicine, and the director of the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care and Sleep Medicine, Dr. Gulshan Sharma. He uh, received his pre-medical degree from uh, Dev College um, and his medical degree from uh, Dayanand, uh, Dayanand Medical College, both in India. And then he moved to the United States for his residency in internal medicine at the Harry Ford in uh, Hospital in Detroit. And then he did a fellowship in pulmonary and critical care medicine at uh, Yale University, where he also got his... Uh, uh, Masters of Public Health. Um, and then he moved here to UTMB, where he started his uh, faculty career as an assistant professor. And at the time, he was a clinician investigator. So he worked a lot with the team in the City Center on Aging. Um, he uh, became a, a, a Pepper Center scholar, and then he got a KO8 of his own from the NIH. And then he became more and more interested in uh, health system and health care. And so he uh, got actually some uh, grant funding from the UT system to, um, uh, to uh, uh, develop computer-based decision-making tools that, that can enhance uh, patient care. And, um, and it's also been a fabulous collaborator for uh, many clinical trials, uh, many large trials that we've been running here at UTMB. And is a very strong advocate for supporting the implementation of research discoveries into clinical practice really quickly. So um, he's published more than 80 papers in peer-reviewed journals and three book chapters and has trained many fellows over the years. Uh, he's received many honors and has been named among the best doctors of America and Texas super doctors for many years. And he's been recently appointed as a, a member of the Delta Omega Honor Society for Public Health and named among the Beaker's Hospital and Health System 100 CMOs to know. And we do know him, so that's good. Um, most importantly, he's led the great response of the UT health system to the COVID-19 pandemic. And so today he will talk about rear view in the COVID-19 pandemic lessons learned. So please join me to welcome Dr. Gulshan Sharma. All right. Thank you, Elena, for that uh, kind uh, remarks. Uh, 
SCOA is my home, and so I love coming to SCOA whenever they call me. So I'm always there. I'm grateful for all the mentorship I have received from all of you guys during this year. So my goal was to, you know, today actually marks almost three years into the pandemic. So I was thinking what title to give. So one thing I was thinking from windshield to Riverview. So I was in the front of all during the entire three years, and I reflect back what went well, what didn't went well, and I wanted to bring it to home because I think oftentimes there are plenty of articles, plenty of papers, you can read it, but you want to see how a one health system in a county where we all live in, what was going on here during different waves and what do we learn each wave. So that's gonna be what my goal is in terms of next 35 to 40 minutes and then I'm open to any Q&A for you. All right, this all started. December 31st, 2019, and this was basically a WHO county office. You know, they were actually in China, and this individual picked up a newspaper. And in the newspaper, they said there is some mystery illness going on in Wuhan, and there were few deaths in that Wuhan area. And that is that person who alerted the WHO that there is something going on here, and let's look into it. Now, you could argue whether December 31st was the right date. There are now some evidence that is suggesting that there are cases that were happening two months or three months prior to this particular date when they first reported the new SARS-CoV-2 virus or COVID-19 by uh, Wuhan. So right then, <clears throat> December 31st, it started, and we actually started our incident command here in January. We met, we said, hey, listen, this is going on in China, but we said, okay, I don't think it's gonna be that big of an issue. We have Galveston National Lab, we have a biocontainment unit, we should be all good whenever we need to handle that. Little we knew, okay? So our first case, I have not said this publicly at a lot of places, but I'm gonna share it with you. So we got a call, in February 14, 2020, from <clears throat> Harris County. There was an individual that works in oil and refinery, and he was posted in Singapore. And he happens to have a girlfriend from Hong Kong who recently visited Wuhan area. So he developed some respiratory illnesses and fever. He was in Singapore. He flew to see his dad in California with symptoms. He stayed one day with his dad, then he flew to Houston with symptoms in that time period. He went to an ED in <clears throat> Montrose area. He had a fever of 104. He had classic symptoms of pneumonia. At that time, the antenna was up. The ED doc called the Harris Health. He said, hey, listen, I have a PUI, person under investigation. He traveled from Singapore, had a girlfriend from Hong Kong, he had these symptoms. What should we do? They said, yes, it is true PUI. You need to collect the sample. Let us call the state. At that time, you call the state, and state will call CDC. CDC has to approve whether you should get tested for COVID or not. So they called the state. State agreed that, yes, he's a PUI, and uh, let's go ahead and test him. So they need to admit him because he was symptomatic. He had high fever and his oxygen saturation was low. That ED doc called all the area hospital. All of a sudden, there was no bed in any of that hospital. This is a true story. So I got a call from DSHS from state that, hey guys, you have biocontainment unit. We have this individual sitting in the ED in Montrose area and had his health. There is no hospital who is accepting this patient. Can you take him? So now another thing is when you have a PUI, there is a lot of laws that you cannot have communicable disease across the county lines. So you are bringing in somebody from Harris County to Galveston County. So we need to involve our local health district to make sure they are in agreement to bring this individual to Galveston. So long story short, we decided that as UTMB, we have a biocontainment unit. You know, we have expertise here, and we should do what is right for the society. This individual is sitting there for almost 12 hours, and nobody wants him. And he had insurance, okay? Those of you who think insurance buys health care, just 
think again. <laughs> it all depends what disease you have. Then only the insurance will buy you the right health care. So we accepted, and this individual came to us one in the morning. And it was undercover. Nobody knew anything, and we didn't open up the biocontainment unit. We have a respiratory isolation room on our, one of the med, med surge floor. We have a team that was already trained in the biocontainment unit. We assembled a team. We took care of this individual. He was with us for five days, and he left well, and that was our first case. Nobody knew that case came. It was in February 14th, and he left February 19th, and he was taken care of, and he did well. He still writes thank you letter from Singapore to us that how we took care of him and that. That was our first case. Now, now the story starts. This was February 20th. I actually took notes, so you see the date. This was a time when we have an outbreak in a ship in Japan. Some of you may not remember that. So there was an outbreak on a cruise ship, and they need to actually evacuate all the US citizen to America. So they brought all to San Antonio in Lackland Air Force Base, 144 of them. Now, there were few positives there. So they were saying the attack rate of this virus is 30%. So they want to keep them in some isolation area. Again, no hospital wants them. So San Antonio has old sanatorium, TB, TB old hospital. So they were able to open up one old TB area where they actually house these individuals for the 14-day quarantine at that time. So this is how the journey started. So officially, we actually got our first patient in March. So I would say this is what we went through, VUCA world. Some of you probably in military knows VUCA. Who knows VUCA? It's actually a term in military, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And this is exactly what was going on during that entire pandemic. And here is the way to look into that. When we look at on the x-axis, how much do you know about that situation? Very little. Too many unknowns, unknowns when this virus started. We were extrapolating data from 1918 flu. We were thinking that people are still disciplined in 1918 compared to what we are now. <laughs> and then we also thought that what happened during the SARS-CoV-1 and cov to the two other SARS virus, it will behave the same way. And there was so much uncertainty, pending change, as well as known, un known unknowns. And then you look at the y-axis, how well can you predict the results of your action? That was also quite controversial, and complexity and volatility also play the role. I thought this was a perfect example of VUCA within the healthcare system when we went through the pandemic. So when we start looking into how we are going to prepare ourselves, we actually had a town hall in early March. We were all there. I think Dr. Patel was with me. We were all saying, hey, listen, we got six-bed biocontainment unit. We figured it out. We can double it. We can take care of 12 patients. This is Galveston. Not too many people are going to fly to Galveston. So we are good. So most time when you look pandemic preparedness, you goes with four S's, basically space, staff, stuff, and systemness. So you need to think about the space where you want to put this patient. You need to have the right staff who can manage these patients, the right stuff, all the supplies that you need. And the systemness, you know, UTMB is not only in Galveston, we are also in Clear Lake and League City as well as in Angleton. So this actually helped us in our favor in terms of having that systemness within UTMB. This is the space. One of the things we quickly ruled out biocontainment unit. We thought there are only six beds. There is no way we're going to take care of these patients in biocontainment. It will be too hard. So that is out. We actually dedicated different units across Jenny Sealy and also across our regional campuses. So we will open up one unit, so it will be 16 beds. We dedicate that to COVID. Once that unit is filled half, then we open up the other unit half, dedicate that to COVID. This is how we were actually creating space as we were going through the pandemic. We actually also, with Dr. Patel's help and our <clears throat> supply chain, we brought air scrubbers. It was not clear whether this is an airborne or droplet. That's different, correct? In airborne, it will be suspended for a while, and you need to scrub the air to make sure there is, the virus particles are not there. Droplet is you need to have very close to the individual to get that infection. 
So it was unclear at that time. It was airborne, but we were actually airing to precautions, and we provide our almost 100 air scrubbers across the health system. Wherever we have COVID patients, even we have very good ventilation, we actually provide extra scrubbers in those areas to make sure our employees are safe. Limited access, so we have those signage out there, and we modified walls to reduce exposure. So one of the things, we did not want our employees to go into patient room, especially nurses. So they have to go 20 times into the patient room. So we actually put a hole in every wall. We draw all the uh, poles, and all the medications were supplied from outside. So if they have to adjust any pressors, if they adjust any medication, they didn't need to go in. Now, there are some pluses and minuses because your tubing is too long in terms of it will take forever the drug to administer from outside to inside. So to have an effect of the drug, it will take a long time. But our main thing there was to provide safety to our patient. This is how we modified across the entire health system when we were managing COVID patients. Staff was another big thing for us. So most of these patients are taken care of by hospitalists or general internal medicine or geriatrics physician who are doing inpatient care, then pulmonary critical care for the ICU. But we don't have enough of those to manage that patient. So we divided all intubation should be done by anesthesiologists. So that way we train them, so that way we don't expose our non-anesthesia physician to intubate the patient. Early on, there was this whole theory coming from Italy and other countries that we need to intubate these patients early. That was wrong. So we realized that we were actually probably harming while intubating patients early. But that was the knowledge at that time. And we try to learn from that and try to avoid intubation as long as we can in these patients. Lab technician, respiratory therapist. So all the things that when you think about an academic medical center, I think we are fortunate that we train these wide variety of folks that are needed to manage patients. You didn't realize how important the RTs are, how important the lab technicians are. We were running 2,000 tests a day. So you need those technicians to be able to run your sample because you just don't swab and put it there and it will get you results. Somebody has to carry it. Somebody has to process it. Somebody has to do quality testing. In addition, outpatient care is also another thing that we looked into and flipped to telemedicine and all the infection control work that Dr. Patel did. This is a, uh, we have a nurses week during that time and there is Veronica in the front there and this was TDC ICU. TDC, our prison hospital, is a very old building. And that was a concern for us, and we actually added more scrubbers in the prison hospital than even in the free world hospital because of the ventilation issue. That building is 1992 in terms of how old that building is. And there was some concern. Stuff was important. Testing, testing, testing. That was the thing that you all heard during that time. And the first test we did, we actually developed with Galveston National Lab. Galveston National Lab got the virus in February 1st, and we were able to, Dr. Piles and Ping Ren from our microbiology area, they were able to develop a test. And we could run the test internally because we can get the result within eight hours because otherwise all the tests were sent to CDC. And we have a much better primer here than even CDC because of the Galveston National Lab. So we did early tests at Galveston National Lab to identify high-risk patients. PPP, PPE was a huge issue. And as you know, we worked on a lot of generosity from a lot of our alumni that provided us a lot of um, PPE. Mechanical ventilators and high-flow oxygen, this is key for these patients. Ventilator, we actually got it even from our education lab. We currently run about 100 ventilators in the hospital. In any given day, 30 or 40 are used, so we have surplus 60. But I can tell you at the peak, we were using every single ventilator we had in the clinical area. Testing and treatment algorithms. You know, I can't thank Dr. Patel and his team, how we build, how to test, when to test, what are the algorithms we need to follow, communication. Most of you attended Q&A sessions that we were doing throughout the pandemic and trying to inform the community and modeling and tracking. And I'm going to share some of our local modeling. And I think when you have your own data, real-time data, you don't need models. 
models are for epidemiologists to predict who don't have real data. We were going through real data every day in the hospital. Systemness helped us tremendously. At that time, League City was only 37 beds. And we have 60 beds shelved, and we were going to open it later time, but we, were ac we actually expedite all the supplies that needed, and we open up 97 beds at League City. That helped us tremendously because most patients came to us from League City area. So they were able to manage them in the League City. Angleton is just 40 beds. Clear Lake was another good acquire for us that we were able to house a lot of COVID patients from Harris County at Clear Lake campus. We did not have enough beds to manage if we were going to manage here at Galveston. Galveston med surge is only 240 beds. At peak, we ran 220 COVID patients across the health system. Tier one clinics where we were actually pushing patients to come and get tested so they are not coming to our other patient population where we're doing regular testing. We did try these tents. You know, it was everybody wanted a tent, so we actually put tents everywhere too to see whether we can use it, but I think it was a bust. We didn't see that there was much benefit of tents in terms of isolating, and telehealth capacity was other thing that we added. All right. This is what we did in terms of incident response tracker. Very quickly, we built this incident response tracker. Here we know real time how many people we are testing, what their test results are, how many patients are getting hospitalized, how many patients are on the ventilator, how many ventilators I am left with, what is my capacity. This actually has feed from a lot of different uh, data sets we have. We also have HR data set here. We were also looking at our employees. How many employees are getting COVID? How many employees are out? We look at number of tests we were doing every day. We actually also did interesting with Juan and Dr. Lapasada's help. We actually had four platform for testing, not one. We knew that one is going to go down. So when we, in the beginning, we added four different platforms because we were running our machines 24-7. And a lot of you know the reagents were going out one after the other. There were not enough reagents to run that many tests. So having that foresight of four different platforms helped us to get the test. We were actually giving tests faster than anybody in Texas. We helped a lot of Texas ED in terms of testing at UTMB. So peak was almost 3,000 tests a day. Another thing we did was that bottom graph there is prediction. Early on when the first virus came, it was so predictable that you get these symptoms, and then within five days, you're going to start getting worse, and 20% of them will get to the hospital. Of those 20%, 5%, that means 25% of that 20% will get to ICU. It was right on the spot. You can, I can predict, okay, I got 100 patients positive today, in five days, I'm going to see 20 of them going to get hospitalized. Five will be in the ICU. 15 will be in the med surge unit. So that helps us predict and open up the beds that we need five days ahead of when we needed those beds. And this model actually predicted so good in the first few waves that we were able to manage that and we would be able to calibrate that and as the virus changes, things didn't work out as well as in the first wave. So first is a ripple. So I'm going to say first is a ripple, then are waves. So I'm going to talk about what happened in the first ripple. The first ripple was March 2020 to May 2020. This was first three months. And this ripple was mostly in the prison population. So we actually filled Hospital Galveston in the first ripple a lot of patients from the prison side got infected, and almost we have 100-bed prison hospital. 80 of the 100 beds were occupied by COVID patients in the first ripple. We didn't have much patient population in the free world at that time. There were a smatter of patients. So I'll tell you, this was typical presentation when during first ripple. Fever, shortness of breath, hypoxemia, bilateral infiltrate on chest X-ray, and then you see... After this, there is nothing typical about COVID-19 presentation. We have people with loss of cell, uh, uh, smell, loss of taste, and people were getting strokes. 
there was all different presentation that came. I tell people, anybody come to the ED unless proven otherwise they have COVID. That is how the situation was early on. So this is a, our cases, so I'm going to share with you. This 60-year-old guy, this is your typical COVID in the first ripple. Fever, you, we have seen patients with fever of 104, 105. Shortness of breath, you see this typical CAT scan. This is classic for COVID unless proven otherwise. You have bilateral airspace disease, black in the lungs is good. Anything white in the lungs is not good. So middle part is your heart, everything else is lungs. So you see that whiteness around the lungs. This is typical presentation of COVID. They will come in, a couple of liters of oxygen. From that, they will get high flow oxygen. They'll get to BiPAP. Then they get intubated by day eight or nine. Then they are on ventilator for days and days and days. That was typical how the COVID was in first wave. This is another case we have, a typical presentation. He's a young guy. He had significant diabetes and comorbidities. As you saw some of the presentation, he had fever, dry cough. He got positive in COVID in April. And he actually rapidly decompensated. He got intubated, paralyzed, prone. He was put on ECMO, which is basically an artificial lung outside your body. So you're basically pumping all the blood through this machine to oxygenate it. He was on ECMO from April 5th, 5th to April 19th, 14 days on ECMO. He got trach, then he actually was discharged home, and he has, he's doing well. So this is typical during our first wave that we did. The public health strategy was classic. Isolate all infected people. Find everyone who has been in contact with infected person. Quarantine all exposed contacts for 14 days and test widely. Basically, the concept is box it in. But the question at that time was, we did not have a public health infrastructure. And who was going to do all this? So it actually came on to the health system with Dr. Patel and his team that they were looking at positive cases. They were finding who their contacts were, calling all these people, getting them tested, putting them in isolation. So that was what was going on in the first ripple or first wave. And there is a lot of popularity of vitamin D, zinc, vitamin C, quercetin, and acetylcysteine. Some people even want snake venom. And I said, we don't prescribe that. And then some people say bees, bee sting. Now, there is something about bee sting. When you look at Wuhan's data, beekeepers did not got severe disease. So there is this idea about bee sting actually improving your innate immunity. So there is some concept to that. It probably, I, I'm not, I don't want you to go now be a beekeeper, okay? Please don't do that, all right? Because, so bee sting was another thing. So a lot of people were saying, I actually did a Q&A session with Angleton Danbury business people, and they asked me this question. They said, hey, we're looking at this literature, and we have these beekeepers, they're doing great. Would you recommend us to buying bees? I said, no, it's too late. So you need to try it early. If all, most of these things, you know, as you, you know, a lot of you guys doing research, it is great for healthy people to take this if you want to take it, but once you have a disease, none of this work, okay? If you want to feel good psychologically, I think they are all great, you know, so that way you can handle COVID better, they're great. But in terms of treatment, they don't. Another thing I did, you know, previously, only drug that showed in vitro activity for SARS virus was hydroxychloroquine. I actually purchased 100 bottles of hydroxychloroquine for the health system during the first wave because I knew it was going to go out. We didn't know what's going to happen, so we just purchased it. We never used it, okay, because the data did not support. In vitro, yes, you can kill anything if you put enough poison on anything, but in vivo, human body, it doesn't work there. All right, another thing is natural immune booster. So we tell people sleep well, meditate, sauna, hot and cold shower. I think this is great. You know, this should be a normal, you guys all know in Sealy Center on Aging, you promote all of this all the time in terms of improving innate immunity to help people. There's all this concept of innate and adaptive immunity. Innate immunity was a big factor in terms of how people responded to this virus. Let's talk about wave one. This is June 2020, August 2020. This was an interesting wave. We saw a lot of embolic events this wave. Clotting, clotting, clotting that we have never seen before. People have ischemia, so this patient have actually ischemic hand and feet. 
this patient pretty much have limb ischemia, so he clotted one leg. Okay, the white is not good, the red one is good, so you can see that. So this patient actually died from hypercoagulable state. So this idea as a physician, you're gonna say, hey, they are clotting, let's anticoagulate everybody. Let's give blood thinner. At that time, we didn't have any medication, correct? This is wave one. We were just track, uh, starting our act one trial to look at remdesivir, steroids, and other thing. And we are seeing a lot of complication. We have a lot of patients with stroke during that wave one. Embolic events and stroke was predominant feature during that. This is a, a pathology of one of the patient, a lot of clots within the lungs. That is another reason we could not oxygenate these patients. Predominantly, COVID virus is a vascular disease. It was actually attacking your endothelium, and it was causing inflammation and clot progression in different parts of your body. And that's why it doesn't matter how much oxygen we were going. The lungs were clear, but they were clotted inside in their pulmonary vasculature, and there's a huge VQ mismatch in these patients. And this is showing all the clots within the pulmonary vasculature, microthrombi in pulmonary artery, and then I decided at that time that, okay, the wave is coming down. I actually went around and did this videos. I think I did probably 20 videos and talking to different people, how their experience has been, and I thought we are done. So this was first wave. We actually closed our unit. One unit that we opened up, you saw that masks that we are wearing, you know, and we get the last patient out. We said we are done. And Dr. Um, Lowe actually helped uh, getting tested for nursing homes. We are really concerned about nursing homes. We did see a lot of patients coming from nursing homes. Nursing homes do not have enough resources. They don't even have resources on a good day, correct? Let alone during the pandemic. So we were helping the nursing homes to get tested and so we can isolate patients in certain areas so they were not infecting patients that are within the nursing home. So we did a lot of that work during the first wave. So right around the first wave, as it was ending, we got two couple of treatments that were approved. One was convalescent plasma. So this is old theory that if you have a lot of antibodies and you give it to people and it will work great, okay? Remdesivir is an antiviral and then steroid. So when everything fails in ICUs, we always go to steroids. So steroids were approved. There was a study done in England that showed actually an approval. The thing is, we also then thought about that there is going to be a lot of patients who are going to have significant symptoms for a prolonged period of time. So we actually started COVID recovery clinic, and we opened up in Clear Lake campus. To date, I think we have seen close to now 700 patients in that clinic with a lot of symptoms, residual symptoms. Most of them were brain fogging, neurocognitive issues, uh, memory loss, issues with focus, and uh, fatigue was major issues in some of these patients. So we continue to see these patients, and this was opened in July of 2020 to help our patients. So at wave one, I was asked to make some predictions how things are going to. These are wave one predictions at that time, and some of them probably are true, some may not be true. So SARS, I said, it will be with us for next 18 to 24 months, nothing um, about me making it for assumption, this is how the 1918 flu was, okay? 18 to 24 months. And we will continue to see these waves around eight to 10 weeks based on the social gathering and how the public health policies were forming during that time. Better antiviral, because we only have IV antiviral at that time available, no oral antiviral were available. Then test at home, especially antigen test, that is the right way to reduce. And then we were trying to think about efficacy versus effectiveness of some of these drugs. We were not seeing improvement that we want to see in our own clinical experience than what we were seeing in the randomized control trial on some of these drugs that were approved. Masking was the best way to reduce at that time, and we also wanted better prediction model. In early on, we realized obesity and diabetes were probably the two most important risk factor for patients who were not having good outcomes in addition to old age. So our wave predominantly in the first one is old age people in terms of having bad outcomes. Safe and effective vaccine will be possible. So those are the wave post one. This is how the disease was. And I think the reason I put this slide, it is important when you use these drugs. So when you think about mild COVID versus severe COVID, you get infected, let's say with somebody, you are going to be infectious at least two to three days before your symptom onset and then up to five days when the symptom starts. 
So you probably infected already your loved ones when you're staying once your symptom onset starts. The antiviral works at that phase within first three to five days of symptom onset. It does not work after that. After that, your body's immune system try to attack, and then you have high inflammation, and you end up having a lot of organ damage. That's where you use immunosuppressive therapies such as steroids. So that's kind of the two-phase model in terms of how we were thinking about uh, COVID. And what I was noticing that people were actually prescribing steroids and antiviral on day one. Actually giving steroids early is actually bad for viral infection because it increases your viral replication further. So you don't want to give steroids early on in this particular disease. Wave two, this is what we were seeing in wave two. Lot of air outside the lung. This, these patients, I've been doing ICU for almost 20 years. These were the hardest patient to ventilate and oxygenate. We actually left patient on 80% saturation. Normally 93% or above is good. We were just leaving. People call that happy hypoxia. They were 80%. And they were just doing fine because I knew if I intubate them, I'm going to make the thing worse. Another thing is if you don't touch the body, leave the body alone, it actually do much better than you mess up with it. That's what I learned from geriatrics. Okay? So when you intubate them, the event VQ relationship is going to be so messed up that you're not going to be able to handle it than the body was handling it. These are the actual patients with a lot of pneumomediastinum. You see a lot of air up there outside the lungs, and we were putting chest tubes right and left. This is another thing happened. Remember I told you wave two, what we learned was clotting? So we were saying, okay, let's anticoagulate everybody. Let's give them blood thinner. You know, common sense, okay? You have a nail, hammer it. That's the way to do it. In this case, we anticoagulate these patients and they start bleeding. We saw a lot of retroperitoneal bleed and abdominal bleed in the wave two. So you see that x-ray there? That red, the big hematoma that you're seeing is not normal in the abdominal wall. That's what we are seeing in that way when we were anticoagulating these patients. Another thing, pneumomediastinum, here it is red, uh, air within the abdomen too. We were putting a lot of patients on ECMO during that time who we think would work out. So this is pretty much what we saw in wave two. Everybody got remdesivir early on. Those who didn't go well and start progressing, we gave them steroids. That was pretty much the course. We did do plasma in some cases, not in every cases. Now, that, there was a ray of hope here. The vaccines got approved, and thanks to uh, Dr. Xi and his team and all of the researchers here, UTMB played a major role in developing Pfizer vaccine. The, we were testing all their antibody titers here. We started this on December 17th. December 17, 2020, we were vaccinating all of our healthcare employees based on the state mandate and all high-risk folks within the community at that time. And then we opened up on different areas in terms of start vaccinating. And we were able to get three effective vaccines in a very short time. Within six weeks period, you got your Moderna, you got your Pfizer, and Janssen and Janssen got approved later too. They all reduced risk of severe disease. I think this was a messaging that went wrong. People thought giving vaccine is going to reduce your risk of infection. The messaging should be, it is going to reduce your risk of severe disease. It is not going to reduce your risk of infection. Because when you give vaccine, you develop antibodies. The way the virus goes, the virus needs IgA in your nose. You don't have any IgA here to hold the virus. But once you give antibodies, the virus will stay here. It won't go into your lungs or to the other part of the body. But the message was wrong. And I think that's what we... People were going one way or the other, and that I think we should have done better. All right. There was something else. Remember, we are on the coastal line. The, so right around that time, we actually got a lot of storm, and Hurricane Laura, we were worried that it's going to hit Galveston. We at that time had 120 COVID patients in our hospital. So as your emergency preparedness officer, I have to figure it out how to evacuate these patients if we have a level four, level five storm. And guess what? No other hospital has any beds. They won't take our patients. So we have to figure it out how we want to manage that. So luckily for us, Hurricane Laura did not hit straight up. 
and it went between Houston and uh, New Orleans, as you saw there. But we have a frost. We never knew that we will have that kind of frost. So two patients that really need water in the hospital are dialysis patient and patient with burn. Everybody else can live without water in the hospital. So we had 20 patients that morning. We actually call incident command at 3 in the morning because we knew that our water pressures were going. So a lot of pipes, there's only one pipe that comes from mainland to island, as you know. And there are a lot of pipes that bust along the way, and we didn't have enough pressure for the hospital. So the pressure was going low and low and low, and we called an incident command at 3 in the morning, and we were all here to see what we're going to do. So we looked at all of our patient census, and we decided, hey, listen, we have 20 patients who need dialysis acutely, and we don't have a ability to do that. Two things we did. We got 70-gallon water, filled that, and we brought a pump from Lowe's, our engineering department, and we created a unit to run a dialysis if we ran out of water within that 12-hour period. Another thing, we were actually transporting our people, a system nest, to League City campus. They have water. The water pressure was fine. And we created, because we have a shelf space there, we opened up a unit to transport all of our dialysis patients there. The problem was there was only, we are only supposed to use Galveston ambulances. There were no ambulances available. Nobody wanted to drive during that period. And if you take one ambulance, it takes four hours to transport one patient. And they only had two ambulances. So we called South Bend, and we actually got this bus. In bus, we can actually transport 10 patients at a time. So we actually transported 10 patients at a time, and every patient was there at before 5 o'clock, so they were safe, so we could dialyze them and took care of them. This was happening right when we were dealing with the pandemic. So here were the possible scenario after vaccine came out. So people thought it could be uh, scenario one, where you could have uh, peaks and valleys. Scenario two, you would have a, uh, a fall and then peak and fall, and then you would have a slow burn. So epidemiologist comes up with this model, and you can say whichever squiggly wave that you want to use that. Which one do you think we end up? Peaks and valleys, uh, which one? Uh, I, I would say scenario two is li more likely uh, in terms of how we end up doing. At that time, we also got antibodies approved. This was a huge game changer for patients who are immunocompromised and who did not respond well to vaccine and who are at risk of severe disease. So we had monoclonal antibody that was available for our patients who were high risk, and we were able to use that. Now, we got a lot of community support, OK? Community came out with their open arms. You know, They were giving us food. We were heroes everywhere. They were treating us well. They were saying hello to everybody. But everything went downhill after that. So this is wave three. Does your wave three is your predominant uh, delta wave coming now, OK? This is what was different in wave three. Wave three mostly was healthy, unvaccinated individuals. They were dying of preventable disease. I have a football player who was 21 year old. I have a pregnant lady who lost the baby and herself. Most of the deaths that happened during wave three were all young, healthy individuals. We were putting them on ECMO. They were truly public anger towards healthcare worker. Personally, I have never seen angrier family members than what I have seen during Delta Wave. They were cursing at us. They were trying to tell us why we have restricted visitation policy. They have bringing their own family member to tell me how to practice medicine. I'm telling you the truth. I had a meeting with a family member. None of them were physicians, OK? They said, listen, we want you to give ivermectin to our loved one. And there were some other issues that were going on. And they said, we want to do this. I said, listen, you're going to kill your loved one, what you're trying to tell me here. That is not what we want to do. And I did not do any of that, but they still complained to Texas Medical Board that I did not follow their recommendation. 
this is serious. Then I have to give my answer and everything went well. But I can tell you how nasty the human beings can be. And here we are working our butts off to trying to save lives. That is our profession. That's why we are in this. But we don't care about these kind of things because there is much greater good that we are all doing. Exhausted healthcare workers. People have not taken any time off. They are coming shift after shift after shift. Staff pouching. That is another thing. It's always good to cry when you have a lot of money than without money, correct? This is what happened. Uh, people were taking our nurses, our RTs, our PTs. They were paying twice the three times the salaries. We were not able to afford that. So we actually saw a lot of exodus of our experienced staff that went to HCAs or other hospital that have big pockets in terms of addressing that. State helped us. You know, state was sending us angel nurses. And the angel nurses were paid very well. But there were some concerns about policies and procedures following. They were just there to punch the time and do the work. And we saw a lot of quality of care actually went down during the pandemic. This is another good cartoon. I'm not taking your stupid vaccine. Nurse, get me some of that livestock anti-parasite drug. We literally have people and our congressmen that called our physician, why are we not giving ivermectin? I'm not telling you a lie. This is true. Janak and I always have to, you know, my answer to that, if a good doctor in his or her good intention want to give you ivermectin, I'm not going to stop that. But I'm not going to endorse ivermectin for treatment of COVID. Because overall, the side effects of ivermectin, now there were three studies came out in JAMA, one after the other. There were low dose, there was high dose, there was prolonged ivermectin. All of them are negative. They did not even show benefits on secondary outcome. Uh, I think a lot of people think that when you have a disease, you can use something out of the shelf. You're lucky if there is something on the shelf that you can use. But there is something to science, and I'll talk about lessons learned. Now, wave four, this is your Omicron, okay? This was a game changer in terms of how this virus modified itself. We got a lot of uh, mutation in the spike protein. Remember, our vaccine is through the spike protein. So if you have a lot of mutation on spike protein, the antibody that we made is not going to fit. And that's what happened, that a lot of patients who are vaccinated or unvaccinated were getting a lot of Omicron during this time. Breakthrough infection in vaccinated individual, unvaccinated were still at risk, less severe disease. In Omicron, we did not see that. Lower need of ICU respiratory failure, lower mortality. What happened in this wave? A lot of our employees got sick. So we did not have enough employees to manage our day-to-day -day operations during Omicron wave. At any given time, we were 100, 150 employees that were positive. Most of them were getting COVID outside the, in the community, hanging out for Christmas or Thanksgiving or other get-together because we still have masking policies across the system, even during Omicron wave. Wave five, you know, is continuation of another variant of uh, Omicron. Now we are at wave six, okay? And that is also a continuation of other variant, and I'm gonna show you some variants soon. Here is what we know. We know what the test, uh, virus is. We know how to test it. We know what is the transmission now. We know some risk factors. And we have a preventive strategy. I didn't add additional vaccines. And we have monoclonal antibodies, antiviral, and then other immunosuppressives. So I'm going to show you. This was a slide that I made uh, eight months ago. And then I have to cut a few of them out. So your antibodies don't work to new variant. So pretty much current treatment is remdesivir if you get early on as an antiviral and steroids if you are in terms of inflammation and you have oral Paxlovid that can be used outpatient. A lot of others are immunosuppressive therapies. So a lot of the things that we thought originally worked, but these antibodies worked great. There were a lot of patients who had very bad headache and fever. Once they get infused with these antibodies, within hours, they showed improvement in that time period. 
This is our study that we publish with uh, Dr. Vega. This actually came right when the Lancet paper came last week. We looked at our community in terms of um, the benefit of infection versus vaccine versus hybrid vaccine and infection. When you look at graph, is the risk of during Delta wave as well as in Omicron wave, the hybrid immunity was the best. So the problem is, you know, if you have a vaccine and infection, you have the best immunity. Vaccine alone, yes, provided some immunity, but the natural immunity was better than even vaccine. It makes sense clinically, correct? When you have natural infection, you have polyclonal antibody, but once you are vaccine, it's only monoclonal antibody to spike protein. And there are multiple proteins on the virus for which you need protection. So having, but the problem is, you don't know how you're going to behave if you get infection first without having vaccine. So that's what I tell people, that it's better to have vaccine even if you get infected. Yes, it will help with your immunity, but you won't have a high risk of dying. So this was just published with the Galveston National Lab. This is, I want to just show you, this is today's statistics. So we have taken care of 36,000 patients since the start of the pandemic. 17,000 unique patients, but 36,000 admissions across the system. This excluded TDC and even uh, prison population. Those are our Galveston tests. Those are the recent number. Right now, we are actually down to close to 10% test positive rate. We do have 29 patients who were with COVID this morning, and you can see breakthrough infection and stuff. These are our waves of admission throughout the health system since the start of the pandemic. This particular um, modeling data that we have currently still runs twice a day. So we look at this data every day to see what's going on at a system level. Do we need to make any changes to our policies? And that is how we decide masking or no masking. What do we need to do? So this is still running. So this is our variant data. So <clears throat> when we look at uh, different waves, so you can see here, you know, your alpha wave, and then you have a big delta wave here and then you have an Omicron wave. So this from Galveston National Lab, and these are different Omicron. We have not now moved away from Omicron. So we have original alpha, beta, delta, Omicron. Now we have a lot of different variants of Omicron. Now Omicron hasn't gone to the next Greek word right now. So it is still Omicron, and you can see all different variants of Omicron. We do still test them on a weekly basis of all the samples that are positive at UTMB. This is our main one now, BQ1 and BQ1.1 and XBB. XBB is expanding, as you see here. XBB started here. It's actually growing up. This is just last week data. And then you have BQ1 and 1.1. So that's kind of where we are in terms of variant. All right. So unanswered question, and then I'll tell you lessons learned. Now, this is what is the origin of SARS-CoV-2? Nobody knows. It's same like who killed John F. Kennedy. You know, there's already mystery novels coming after one after other. We will never know. But when you look at previous SARS viruses, we were able to find intermediary host within four months. We are three years into this pandemic. We have not found an intermediary host for this virus. So the idea of lab theory is there. I don't think we should disregard that completely, okay? And that's why we're never going to be able to figure it out, because otherwise we should have found an intermediary host and said, oh, that's, it's closed, we move forward. Another thing which is very interesting is why each wave is 10 to 12 weeks. I don't understand that. Every wave is just comes 10 to 12 weeks. You can say, oh, maybe we are isolating people, and everybody who wants to get sick gets sick within 10 to 12 weeks. But it is uncanny when you look at every peak and valley. It's 10 to 12 weeks, 10 to 12 weeks. Who is at risk? I've shared that, but there are all these blood type issue. You know, people were saying if you are A versus O, uh, nobody it didn't, it didn't pan out whether blood type makes a difference. Now, there are truly individuals who are resistant to this virus. They have found families in Brazil and other South American countries where they genotype them, and they're trying to figure out what is unique about that. One thing is that virus is when you have virus, you release interferon. Interferon is the one that helps prevent viral further replication. People who are not able to generate interferons or they have mutation to interferons, they are the one who is at risk to getting bad disease. 
That's one thing that people have found out. But giving interferon has not shown to benefit. Threshold for herd immunity in a community, we don't know that. You know, People said 50%, 70%. Now there's almost 90% immunity in the community right now, correct? If you do vaccination versus natural infection, but we are still getting cases where people are still positive. You know, is it a, another cold virus that we're going to continue to have? Are we there yet? I don't know. How often we need to re-immunize? Uh, even though the U.S. government has released annually, I'm not sure. You know, it's too early to say whether annual vaccine is going to prevent this if they are thinking Omicron is the last variant and that will provide us the immunity that we need. Our genetic profile protective, we talked a little bit about long-term effects. You saw that. Will Omicron be last variant? So I'll sit with you. I'll learn this over the next few months or years to see when the last chapter is written about this. So what are the lessons learned? Quickly, unified and clear communication. I think we failed here. Uh, I think, you know, if we have to think about, we have to have people who are expert to give their opinion rather than folks who wants to do podcast or other folks who do not have good understanding to provide public health opinion about this virus. Community is essential. I can't thank our community. I think we did very well in this area. We have very strong partnership with the Galveston County Health District, as well as our nursing homes and other areas. You know, Tammy and her team actually went to nursing homes when the vaccines were available because they were not able to come to our clinics. So how we help our community is also important. And community help us. Masks are useful. I don't care what people think. I think masks help us tremendously uh, during the pandemic, uh, when we were taking care of these patients, we would have, I would round on 24 ICU patients, 12 were ventilated. So every single day, you know, you go in, you see these patients, and we have no vaccines are effective, no question about that. Trust is most delicate, but critical, okay? I think people just start having misinformation, and trust is important, but it takes time to build, I think we go back to is why are people not getting vaccines? You know, think about the history of medicine at, in the U.S. So people were truly not trusting community about it. Telehealth, it worked great. We actually moved all of our clinic to telehealth to help, and the government helped support that work. Employee loyalty is earned and matter. I cannot stress that. I think this clearly came when people were leaving for $10, $20, $30 more. You know, and in the time when you were in crunch and you needed their services, and I think we need to work better in terms of employee loyalty. Staffing contingency, you know, this is important. You know, we use medical students too. So we need medical students, nursing students to help write notes, things that they can't do in terms of direct patient care. They can be helping us. But the challenge here was service versus education. You know, they were thinking that, okay, if you take them two months to do patient care in the clinical side, how are we going to grade their semester? This was true discussions. Everybody wants to help, but to a certain extent. You know, because I can't grade them for that semester because they're going to say, okay, how are we going to handle their education? Humility. I can't stress, I think there is still a lot we don't know. You need to be humble about your decision-making and how, what you are saying. Last few, government stimulus cash on hand matters. Why, that's why U.S. done well. Billions and billions of dollars got poured in. We were not able to do this work if we did not have the um, contract agency that state supplied us. We were not able to get that. At one time, we have 100 nurses and about 40 RTs that supplied by state. They paid their reimbursement. We didn't have to pay any of that. And government paid for any COVID testing as well as any COVID admission that they did not have insurance for. So government stimulus really helped. Most clueless how science work. You all know that. And I think people were trying to practice science based on an editorial or a news clipping, and that was wrong. It takes time to have good science. You're not going to be able to do clinical trials that fast. I still think it was a miracle how the scientists got together around the world they have meetings after meetings. They were trying to help and build some of these things. Politics override public health. This is, is a big concern. I think we need to give it to public health officials. The problem is the public health infrastructure is not that robust anymore in the U.S. So I think there needs to have additional attention. 
we actually serve de facto public health for Galveston County as a health system. That's not our role, correct? But we did what needs unequal treatment and outcomes. It was very clear in terms of mortality among blacks versus whites. Now, is it truly COVID-related or there is more to it that was going in in terms of unequal treatment and outcomes? We noticed that we were wrong in measuring pulse ox in black versus white. When you measure your oxygen saturation, most of these machines were overcounting oxygen saturation in blacks versus whites. So it could impact 3 to 4% when you are a lower level of oxygen saturation. So if your oxygen saturation is 96%, that's great. You don't have to worry about it. If your oxygen saturation is 88%, you are down by 4 or 5 in terms of your assessment, so you may need to get oxygen there. So that was very clear. Is pandemic every country for itself? And you saw that. Nobody wants to share their vaccines to everybody. They want to hold as much drugs as they want, and they want to hold as much vaccines as they want. But they release a little bit here, a little bit there. But that was a struggle across the world. Calculus for kids is just different. I think this is something that we're going to learn a lot in coming years. I think kids have lost a lot over the last three years in terms of no social interaction, spending too much time on TikTok, you know, and not able to see their uh, uh, physicians or see their teachers in person. I think we're going to see that there is going to be significant impact of COVID in children, I think we were a little too quick in saying that kids need not to go to protect the teacher. I think that was the main thing. So we should have masked the teacher, and the kids should still continue to go and attend the school. That's something that I think some lessons learned. All right, this is all I have. Thank you for the opportunity, and I'm happy to answer any questions. All right. So thank you so much, Gulshan. This has been a wonderful talk. And uh, we, I want to remind you, those who are online, there's a chat that you can write questions into, and then we're going to read them and ask to the speaker. And if there's anyone here in the audience who wants to ask a question, raise your, raise your hand, and uh, we'll, we'll take the question. Hello. Hey, uh, thanks for taking my question. So it seems like the issues you mentioned with our response to COVID were very like culturally uh, embedded into how we view and respond to problems. Do you see those things changing in the future if like another COVID pandemic was to happen or something similar? Or do you think it's going to be kind of the same game? Um, answer to that is we don't learn anything from history. If I'm alive for next pandemic, I'm sure I'll learn good lessons. We didn't learn anything from 1918 pandemic because that generation no longer exists, correct? That is the idea about we don't learn anything from history because we have not gone through that. I would say definitely, if I have another pandemic, I wish we don't have many more. I think one in lifetime is good enough. Um, but I think we could do things differently. But the health systems are not made to take care of pandemic. I think we have to cut all of our infrastructure because there was, you know, people make money on elective surgeries, okay? That's what hospital runs. So what happened was some hospitals were doing elective surgery, other hospitals were picking up all COVID patients, okay? So that was another thing that was going on during the pandemic until the state governor actually said, no, moratorium on elective surgery, you need to handle pandemic patients. And that was what was going on. We never send any of our COVID patients in the health system to any hospital. We always have a space for any patients that came to our ED. As I said, at peak, we ran 220 patients with COVID across the health system. So you are right. You know, I think uh, there's always going to be a public health infrastructure that needs to be done. I think health systems are always there, especially academic health systems are always there to help humanity during the time of crisis. But thank you for that. Thank you. Any more questions? Anybody online? Yes, uh, Kelly's going to read the one of the online questions. Now we have one vaccine after another vaccine for a different variant of COVID virus. Is it possible that now we will need a new vaccine every year? As I shared, I don't know the answer. I would sit tight in terms of, I think they are saying annual vaccine, and we saw the data. I think if you 
we are trying to do antibody titers too in certain cases. There are two parts to it. Whenever you have vaccine or natural infection, once you do is antibodies, and second, you have T cells, which are memory cells. So that memory cells actually do provide quite a bit of immunity to you, but you can't measure that in a normal human being unless you have sophisticated testing. So I don't the answer that whether the animal vaccine is the right way, but right now we are using uh, the variant, the combination of original versus Omicron variant right now as a booster or as an animal vaccine. I think Dr. Patel was here, he left. I would have asked him that question. But personal, my personal view is sit tight. I, I think it's too early to say that people need annual vaccines. Thank you very much. Any more questions? If not, we can all, oh, no, I see a question there. Yeah. I just want to thank UTMB. I was part of the first wave in catching COVID and was treated at UTMB after four months. And here I am still kicking and alive. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And so now I think we can all uh, uh, enjoy the wine and cheese uh, session. And if you have more questions for our speaker, you can come up and talk to him while he's having a glass yeah. of wine. Thank you. So.